Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, and uh, voice is kind of on the edge here. We'll see, see, how, we, see how we do. <clears throat> when we left off uh, uh, before I went on the trip, we covered the first 23 verses, which is really the prayer of Daniel. And you remember uh, Daniel's praying. He's very concerned for two reasons. He's concerned because he realizes, because he's reading the word, and he's reading the prophet uh, Jeremiah, that the, <clears throat> the 70 years of captivity is just about up. He's, he's gone into that captivity as a young teenager, probably around 15 years old, and he's kind of approaching 85, and he's realizing, again, going over the scriptures, that uh, that, that time of captivity is about up. Time is very short. He also reads in, in chapter 29 where Jeremiah says that um, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you seek me with all of your heart. And he knows that people are not seeking God with all their heart. So he realizes that time is very short and the people really aren't seeking God the way they should. And uh, easy to draw a parallel with uh, our own lives to realize that in studying prophecy, and as we'll do this morning, that time is very short and as, at least as a, a country, as a culture, we'd say people are not seeking God with all of their heart or they would be finding him. And, uh, and so the prayer of Daniel was... I think very uh, helpful and instruction, instructional for us in how we should pray. But the answer to that prayer now comes through the angel Gabriel uh, and lays out uh, a lot of information and a lot of information that's uh, numbers and can be kind of confusing and, and um, fly from another part of the world and get four hours sleep and, and go over it a few times. It's really confusing. <laughs> if you had called me two o'clock yesterday afternoon while I was going over this, I'm not sure I could have given you my name or the name of the church. Uh, it was, it, it, and I went. I, I actually had this prepared before I left. I was just trying to go over my own notes. So uh, anyway, I hope you had that extra cup of Starbucks. Uh, this is a little bit more of a Bible study than a sermon, uh, but we'll try to keep all the numbers uh, uh, straight for you because it's uh, incredibly. Uh, important passage of scripture because it lays out for us the timetable of when the Messiah would come to the exact day uh, and then talks about other future events that are uh, still waiting to, uh, to take place. A lot of times our, if you're uh, in the college arena in particular, but even in the high school arena, your faith comes under attack and uh, it's important to have studies like this to realize that, as we say, Christianity is evidential by its very nature. And what I mean by that is there's tremendous evidence for why we believe what we believe. And sometimes when people say, well, how can you believe the Bible? Well, it's the Word of God. Well, how do you believe that? Well, it says so. You know, that's kind of circular. Uh, but beyond that, it's because of passages like this that are, uh, and like Daniel uh, in its entirety, that lay out history pre-written in advance with exact uh, and very specific details, and we get to one of those passages this morning. Let's take a look at uh, the first part. is going to give us specific statements concerning Israel's future, and there are seven of them in verse 24. Again, Daniel chapter 9. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So there are seven uh, very specific things that are mentioned in answer to Daniel's prayer. And the first we see is there's a decree given by God, for he says, 77s are, are decreed. That means uh, God said it and it's going to happen. It's going to happen exactly uh, this, this way. <laughs> We've kind of seen that, and we might say that <clears throat> the sovereignty of God is kind of a theme throughout the book of Daniel. Uh, it also says it pertains to, uh, to Israel, your people and your holy city. There's uh, over the years, uh, people, some uh, theologians have looked at this and tried to somehow apply it to the church, apply it to a particular group of people. No, it's, uh, it's in particular, it's particular to the Jews and to Jerusalem. Uh, so there's a, a decree by God that is particular to the Jews and to Jerusalem. Uh, and it's going to take up a, a 70, a 490 year period. When he uses the term sevens, it's the word shabuah, and it means a week of sevens. We might say, uh, for example, we would use the term decade, and we would say, if nine decades had passed, how many years that would be? Not as old as Charlie. You, you were thinking that right, because he's older than that. 
I've been waiting to use that for you, Charlie. Uh, nine decades, 90 years. So the, uh, it's a little confusing to us. We don't use this term, uh, a weeks of sevens, Shabuah, but uh, a typical Hebrew term. So uh, here Daniel says there are going to be things that happen if you multiply it out, it's 490 years. So within a 490-year period, there's going to be some things that happen that are decreed by God that have to do with uh, the Jewish people, Israel, and in particular, uh, Jerusalem. So far, so good. Point two, there's a rebellion in the future. <laughs> he talks about the fact that uh, transgression is going to happen, and, and it, it's mentioned as a singular event uh, and a specific event. So again, what is the, uh, the transgression or the rebellion uh, that's going to take place in the future in regards to Jerusalem uh, and, the, and the Jewish people? Well, it's the rejection of their, their Messiah. We're going to read later, Daniel said, and when he comes, he'll be, he'll be cut off. <clears throat> so within a 490-year period, uh, the, there is going to be uh, the Messiah that will, uh, that will come, but he's going to be rejected. Again, predicted by, uh, by Daniel here. Zechariah 12.10 uh, says this. He says, I, in the future, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will warn for him as one who mourns for an only child. And grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn uh, son. Again, why, why are they grieving now that they see Jesus? Because they, he was the one that they pierced. He was the one that they rejected. Verse 11, on that day the weeping of Jerusalem will be great, like the weeping, uh, weeping of Hadan Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn each clan by itself, with their wives by themselves. And then it goes on to talking about the different houses of uh, of Israel. So they're all going to weep, Zechariah says, because they will realize that they, in fact, did what Daniel said was going to happen. They rejected the Messiah. Chapter 13, uh, uh, Zechariah continues and says, though, on that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sin in impurity. So within a 49, a 490 year period, uh, the Messiah is going to come, but he's going to be rejected. Uh, eventually, we know, though, that uh, nationally the Jews will accept Jesus as their Messiah, and they will mourn for him as that point as one mourns for an only uh, child, and God in response will pour out his spirit of grace and supplication upon them. Now, Paul in the New Testament makes reference to this in, in Romans eleven twenty five, 25, and he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you uh, may not be conceited. Israel's experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godliness away from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Paul says, you Gentiles that are being saved now, uh, don't let it go to your head too much. Uh, remember, and don't, in a sense, he's saying, and don't turn against Israel, because remember, it's out of them that you, uh, you've grown. Uh, they've experienced a hardening in part or a spiritual blindness for a time. Uh, it will last only until the, the number of the Gentiles or the fullness of the number of the Gentiles have come in. Uh, so there's going to be a, a period of time where the gospel is going out to to uh, non-Jewish people in great numbers, which is obviously the, the times that we're living in now. But that time will come to an end, and that time will come at the end of this 490-year uh, period. Israel rebellion or transgression will happen, but it will end in the future. And, uh, and certainly in the book of Acts, we see the progression of the gospel going to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. There's a point in time when the church will be raptured, uh, the time of the Gentiles continue, though, because there's other Gentiles being saved during the tribulation. There's a point in time when, when it all ends, when Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth. That ends that 490-year period. Still okay? Number three, there'll be a time of judgment. Uh, what does it mean to put an end to sin? Uh, well, it, uh, again, it's in particular to the Jews and the holy city, Jerusalem. So it's uh, he's talking about a, a specific event. And again, Zechariah the prophet helps fill in some of the, 
uh, information here. Zechariah 13, 8 says, In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our, our God. In the future, within that 490-year period, there'll be a time where where the Jewish people reject their Messiah. In the end, they will cry out and receive him, and Jesus will return to planet Earth. Uh, and at some point in time, what we would call the tribulation, there's still a great testing uh, that will go on. How great? So great that, that two-thirds still reject the gospel. One-third receive it. There's about 17 and a half million Jews in the world today. Uh, and if, uh, if uh, Zechariah is talking about worldwide, then there will be about... If numbers don't change dr drastically, about 6 million Jews that will receive Jesus as their Savior and Messiah during that, that what we call the tribulation period. Ezekiel 20, uh, 32 goes on and says, uh, As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I will rule over you with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. With outpoured wrath, I will bring you from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath, I will bring you into the desert of the nations and there face to face I will execute judgment upon you. He goes on to talk about how you'll pass under the rod. It's a, the rod of judgment. So again, this is another specific event that is still yet future, but will take place within the 490 year period. Four, there'll be an offering for sin. He uses the term to atone for Wickedness, and this obviously is talking about the, the Messiah that will come, <laughs> that will atone for their sin, the sins of the world. Paul makes reference to that in 2 Corinthians 5, 19. Uh, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them. And he's committed to us a message of reconciliation. Isaiah the prophet says the Redeemer will come from Zion uh, and to those in Jacob who repent of their sins. So, uh, again, Daniel says, in this Babylonian captivity, when all Israel is destroyed, there is no temple, there is nothing there, it's all burned to the ground. But he's saying, in the future, within a 490-year period, uh, there's going to be very specific things that, that happen. Uh, this is all decreed by God. It's, uh, it's going to go down just the way he has said. Now, uh, again, we, it's easy for us to, to, to look back, uh, you know, retrospect and go, yeah, Jesus came. We got that. Yeah, they rejected him. And, uh, but he, you know, rose again from the dead and, uh, and so forth. But, uh, you know, we're looking at it from the other end. Daniel is predicting all these things before they've ever taken place. Jesus makes an, uh, an interesting statement about this uh, idea of uh, his coming to be the sacrifice for Israel one day when he goes in the synagogue and he opens the scroll of Isaiah and he begins to read from it. Uh, he could have read from a, a lot of different places, but he picks out Isaiah 61.1 uh, that says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he stops and he rolls up the scroll. Jesus came during that time to be the appropriation, uh, appropriation or the sacrifice for our sins. He says, I've come to bind up the brokenhearted, to preach good news to the poor and so forth, to proclaim the year of God's favor. Here's their opportunity. The Messiah has, uh, has come. Now what Isaiah goes on and says, though, the part that Jesus didn't read is that in the day of the vengeance of our God and to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. That's because that's still yet future. It's not going to happen. But Jesus did come to proclaim the year of God's favor or his grace uh, upon the Jewish people as he comes as their Messiah. Uh, again, but uh, Jesus doesn't proclaim God's vengeance. Uh, uh, that's still yet future. Obviously, that didn't happen during his time. The fifth thing, Daniel mentions there'll be a time of everlasting righteousness. And uh, uh, we're just really enjoying that, aren't we? 
No, uh, we're not, <laughs> it's not, not, not a lot, a lot, not a lot of everlasting righteousness out there. If, uh, if you haven't looked around lately, that's still yet future. So during the 490 year period, the Messiah is going to become, but he's going to be rejected. The Jewish people are going to be judged by God and, and a third of them, about six a million are going to come to faith in, uh, in Christ. They are going to cry out to the Messiah to accept him, Jesus, and then he comes back in that 490 year period. Then we enter into a period of everlasting righteousness. We refer to that as the millennial reign of, uh, of Christ. Uh, Jeremiah 23 says, uh, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, another name for the Messiah, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Uh, again, sometimes prophecy is like seeing pieces of a puzzle and we've got to kind of connect them a little bit to begin to uh, to see the whole picture. But Daniel's given us some very specific details. The sixth thing that he says will happen during this time period is there will be an end to direct revelation from God. He says, to, he mentions the phrase to seal up vision uh, and, and prophecy. So uh, during this 400 uh, and 90 year period, uh, sometime in that period, direct revelation from God will end. Now, during that time, God's speaking through the prophet Daniel. He had already been speaking through the prophet Jeremiah and Isaiah and Zechariah and some of the other ones that uh, we're reading. He'll continue to speak through Malachi and Hosea and, and others as they're back in the land once again. Uh, and then we've got the New Testament where God is speaking to uh, Matthew and John and, uh, and so forth. There's a time when, when it's all done and it's all sealed up. And the last prophecy that where God spoke through uh, a prophet is, is what we call the book of Revelation by the apostle John. And John says this in Revelation 22, 18. He says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes uh, words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. John writing from Pathmos, getting this revelation from Jesus Christ about 90 AD, at the end says, uh, this, this is it. And uh, uh, so the next time somebody comes knocking at your door, riding those uh, mountain bikes around, dressed very nicely though, uh, you know, and they have another book, which is a, a newer revelation or a greater revelation. You could say, no, actually, Daniel the prophet said there's a limited time when God would be revealing himself prophetically through uh, written scripture. Uh, and we know that that time ended in, uh, in about 90 AD. And John says, anybody that adds to the word or takes away from it, uh, not good things are going to uh, come their way. Now, there's another uh, very good cross-reference that's important to point out in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, and we'll actually read to, to verse 4, because the writer of Hebrews says basically the same thing and helps us with the timing of all of this. He says there, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophet at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, uh, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the, the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Here the writer of Hebrews says, in the past, God spoke through the prophets, various times in various ways. That's all ended now because God has spoken to us through his son. Through his son, notice that it's after his death and his resurrection. What is, what is the last prophecy that we have that is the revelation of Jesus Christ that is post or after his death and his resurrection? It's the book of Revelation. It begins by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there, John says, and the writer of Hebrews says, that this is it. It's all you've got. You ain't getting any more. It fits in with this 490-year period. We'll talk about when the clock started on that 490-year period uh, in just a moment. But again, God spoke through various prophets various times in the past, but it ends with the book of Revelation. Um, 
7, there'll be a future temple in Jerusalem. He uses the phrase, and to anoint the most holy. It's really literally talking about the holy of holies. And again, Daniel is writing, and when there is no temple, there is no city, there is no nothing that's burnt to the ground. But he says, in the future, within this time period, there is going to be a, a, another temple that uh, gets rebuilt. Now, if you were in Israel today, and you asked uh, uh, any of the rabbinical teachers there if there'll be another temple, they will all say, yes, there'll be another temple, and it will get built by the Messiah. And they're waiting for it. It's very interesting. Now, we know from... Uh, other prophecies that there is this man that's going to come on the scene, a lot of different names, man of lawlessness, man of sin, and so forth. We call him the Antichrist because he comes on the scene against Christ, but he looks like Christ, very charismatic, loving, good, wonderful person that uh, you know the whole world will uh, embrace and so forth, and then uh, eventually become a world leady, leader and a religious world leader. He'll make a way for the Jews to rebuild a temple there. This temple, that temple is not going to get anointed in terms of the holy of holies, in terms of the presence of God. So here, what's being spoken of is the temple described in uh, Ezekiel. In the last nine chapters, uh, there's a temple described there, and it's described, it's huge, and it's uh, described in great detail. The whole topographical or geographical area of Jerusalem is altered and changed. There's a river that flows out of this temple and, and so forth. It's the temple that will be there during the millennial reign of Christ. So there's a 490-year period. All these things are going to click, click off. Uh, the Jews are going to reject the Messiah nationally. Um, uh, we'll, we'll read about in a moment that he ends up being cut off. There's a time of judgment for them, but yet they cry out and receive him at that 490 years. At that point, there's a time of everlasting righteousness, and there's a time when this, what we'd call the millennial temple, is going to get uh, rebuilt. So some of these things we'll see in a moment have already happened. Very specifically, others are yet future. So Again, a decree is given by God. There's a rebellion in the future. There's a time of judgment. There's an uh, offering for sin, the Messiah. There will be a time of everlasting righteousness, an end to direct revelation from God. There'll be a future temple uh, in Jerusalem. So seven very specific statements. Now he gets to very specific uh, dates in verse 25 to 27. There he says, no one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one, another name from Messiah, will be cut off and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end. Desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decree is poured out on him. A little cryptic, but uh, it, uh, somewhat straightforward. We'll try to sort through some of the numbers. First, we know there will be a command to restore and rebuild the walls of, of Jerusalem. We see that in verse 25. Uh, no one understand uh, this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed, until the Messiah comes, the ruler comes. There'll be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It'll get rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of, of trouble. So the key term here is with, uh, with streets and with a, a trench because there's four commands to restore and rebuild uh, Jerusalem. Daniel's saying that uh, we can do a mathematical calculation and we can go from this decree and know the exact day that the Messiah will come. Uh, but uh, it's not just restoring uh, the city or the temple. It's when the walls are built because it's with a trench like a moat. And you have to have a wall to be able to do that. Cyrus uh, gives the command to rebuild the temple in 538. Darius confirms it in 519. Artaxerxes uh, commands the temple to get rebuilt also in 458. Uh, and all three of these guys are mentioned in the book of uh, Ezra. But it's a guy named Langamanius Artaxerxes, uh, again his full name, who gives the command in 445 B.C. Uh, there in the book of Nehemiah to restore the walls. And that's the command that we're looking for. Nehemiah 2.1 says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. So, 
Uh, we know that it's uh, in the 20th year of his reign. We know that it's in the month of Nisan. When it doesn't give us the date, it's because it's the first day of the year. So it's our first day of the month. So it's the first day of Nisan. Uh, it's in the 20th year of his reign. Historically, we can go back and, and come with that, up with that, uh, uh, that date exactly. We also know that there are two time periods uh, given. So Daniel's already mentioned the 490 years. Now he says there's, there's two specific time periods, seven sevens and 62 sevens. So uh, the 69 sevens are 483 years. And then there's going to be another seven-year period. And I think I got a little PowerPoint <coughs> thing to help us with that. So um, go ahead and go to the next, the next one. So in that 490-year period, now it's getting more specific. I think you'll have to, there we go. So we've got the 483 years, the 69 sevens, and then the one seven, uh, two time periods that are, that are broken up. And Daniel is saying that from the command to restore Jerusalem with walls from that date uh, until the time of the Messiah coming, it will be exactly 483 years. This is all based on the Babylonian calendar or a prophetic calendar of 360 days per year. So it comes out to be 173,880 uh, days. <clears throat> now, again, there are uh, specific things that will, will happen here. Uh, let's go back to verse 26 here. He says, after 62 sevens, the united one will be cut off and have nothing. The people, the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been uh, decreed. So uh, we know exactly uh, the starting point of when the decree was given. Uh, we can count 173,880 days, and the Messiah should come on that day, but he gets cut off and has nothing. And, uh, and obviously, the, uh, from our perspective, we look back and say, well, that's exactly what happened in terms of, uh, uh, of Jesus uh, coming. Uh, the dates that, uh, that we can track down with this are, uh, are pretty, uh, pretty easy to uh, substantiate. Uh, Longomanius Artaxerxes ascends to the throne in 465 B.C. 20th year of his reign puts him in 445 B.C., uh, in the month of Nisan on the Jewish calendar, uh, in our calendar, it comes out to be uh, March 14th. So for March 14th, 445 B.C., it won't be on a test or anything. But from that day, you can start counting. And when you get to 173,880 days, the Messiah should show up and come walking through the streets of Jerusalem. Or Daniel is a, a false prophet. And, uh, and in reality, that is the exact day that Jesus comes down from the Mount of Olives, what we know as Palm Sunday, when he is greeted and accepts their proclamation. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, proclaiming him to be uh, the Messiah. The, uh, the April 6th, uh, 32 AD uh, is uh, the exact date. And um, uh, I'll just give you a couple of uh, references uh, for that because some people say, well, yeah, where'd you get that date? You know, <laughs> but uh, we get it uh, from a reference to Roman history. Uh, that's given in John 20. Uh, there John is writing uh, and gives us a very specific date. He said, the, the Jews replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he's spoken of was his body. And he was raised from the dead. His disciple, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. Uh, well, again, we, there we have a date of uh, 46 years to build the temple. And they were still working on it. It started in, eight, in 18 B.C. They don't finish it until 64 B.C. Uh, if they've been working on it for 46 years, then uh, when this is said is Passover 29 A.D. Now, we, every time they come back to, back to town for Passover, it's, we're told about it in the gospel. It happens three more times, and then Jesus is crucified, so we know that it's uh, 32 AD. Uh, again, exactly what uh, Daniel said. Second reference from Roman history is uh, Luke in Luke 3.1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of uh, Judea, Tiberius uh, takes uh, the throne in uh, August 19th, 14 AD. Therefore, the 15th year is uh, 28 AD. Jesus is baptized in the uh, fall of 28 AD. And therefore, if you Again, count off the dates and the number of times that he comes to Jerusalem for Passover. Uh, from that point in time, you get to 32 AD. 
and, and we know when Passover occurred in that year, therefore we can get the exact date. Jesus makes a, a very interesting statement about this as well in Luke 19, 37. And this is when he is coming into Jerusalem on that date. It says, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, quoting the Old Testament, proclaiming Jesus to be the Messiah. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Why are the stones going to cry out? Because this is the day that Daniel predicted the Messiah would come. And if they don't, if they don't cry out and proclaim me the Messiah, those rocks over there will. Uh, because this has been decreed by God. Uh, verse 42 or 41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an abatement against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Daniel said that there'll be a 490-year period, and then he breaks it in two. And there's 483 years, and there's another seven-year period. And he says certain things, specific things, are going to happen during this time. And the Messiah is going to come on an exact day, and then he's going to be cut off. Uh, there's going to be a judgment against the Jewish people as a result. There's going to be a time when they cry out at the end, and he comes back. There's going to be a time when all their sin and iniquity is forgiven, is forgiven and he pours out a spirit of grace and supplication upon them. A new temple is re rebuilt. It's described in Ezekiel and we move into a time of everlasting uh, righteousness. Uh, again, uh, in John 12, uh, we have the, the same scene described uh, again. And uh, in verse 16 of John 12, it says, Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him uh, and that they had done these things to him. So it's only after the death and the resurrection of Jesus that they go, oh, <laughs> I got it. And uh, it is amazing from our perspective, is it not, that how did they miss this? You know, I mean, uh, remember when Jesus talked to the Pharisees? Uh, and again, this is a, even according to Jewish history, this is a very corrupted group of leaders, uh, that are overseeing the nation religiously of, uh, of Israel. So that's certainly part of the problem. But he says, you err because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. They didn't really know the scriptures. I mean, they, they knew oral traditions and their own thing that they had developed, but they didn't really think it through what Daniel had, uh, had said. And, there, and obviously there are many, many more scriptures that uh, Jesus had fulfilled uh, in his coming. So uh, was... Uh, was he cut off? And certainly uh, he was, as the, uh, again, uh, another crowd shouted out, crucify him, not necessarily the same crowd uh, that proclaimed him to be the Messiah, because those are mostly his followers from Galilee and those that were from Bethany, who only a week before had seen uh, Lazarus raised from the dead. They're proclaiming him, you the man in the vernacular. They're saying, you're the Messiah. Uh, it's really, some of them could have been mixed in, but primarily it was a different crowd that was controlled by the Sanhedrin that stood in the courtyard of Pilate a week later and said, uh, crucify him. The Messiah, like Daniel said, uh, was cut off. What else did Daniel say? And the city would be destroyed. And we know that it was then in 70 AD, just uh, a short time later. It's finished. The temple is actually finished in 64 AD. Six years later, it's, uh, it's destroyed. It is destroyed. So again, so here we've got the, the 69 weeks, the 483 years. We've got Jesus coming. He's cut off. He ascends. That next little arrow is a reference to the rapture. It's going to take place sometime between these two time periods because they're split now. We have another one week or seven year period that is still yet to be fulfilled that, that we refer to as the, uh, as the great tribulation. And, uh, and then lastly, uh, there'll be a ruler for that final seven year period uh, in verse 27. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven or a seven year period. In the middle of the seven, he'll put an end to sacrifice and offering and on the wing, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. 
So the he here is the person referred to as the Antichrist. He's going to come. Daniel now tells us again that that last seven-year period, even that is split in two. We talk about it being the first half and the second half of the tribulation. Uh, he's going to come. He's going to set up, a, 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 again, a covenant with, uh, with uh, Israel so they can rebuild the temple. It was a very big issue uh, uh, today. And uh, we've talked about this uh, a little bit in the past, but uh, as Condoleezza Rice is flying around and meeting with the various heads of states and so forth, one of the things they're discussing is how can we make a way for the Jews to be able to restore, uh, rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount. These are things that Daniel said all this time ago would take place, and we live in those, those days right now. Uh, we mentioned, I've mentioned before the fact that it's actually uh, was referred to at one time as the Clintonian plan. It was under Bill Clinton's uh, presidency, he suggested that one of the ways that we can help bring peace to the Middle East, we can help uh, uh, maybe pacify the, the nation of Israel to give up more land if we allow them to build, rebuild the temple on the, on the Temple Mount. So uh, these things have been discussed and discussed openly for quite some, uh, some time now, just uh, Again, interesting days that, uh, that we live in uh, because, uh, again, uh, now there is someone representing the, the uh, European Union who is out there trying to make seven-year deals with other countries. He is the lead negotiator and really the most powerful guy in the European Union right now trying to work out a deal with Israel. They've got Hamas, which is a terrorist organization that now has totally taken over uh, the Gaza Strip. They've got Nasrallah up in the, up in the north who's been uh, now for a year smuggling arms from Syria that come from Iran that are funded by, uh, by Putin and Russia. And, uh, and all these things that the Bible have talked about and described about Son of a gun, if they aren't just happening <laughs> all, all, all around us. It's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, time to, to live in. Uh, I don't know if you saw the announcement by putting about, uh, it was right before I left, so about three and a half weeks ago or so, uh, about the idea. Now, we, we had said it looked like he was going in the direction that he wanted to be the, the new czar of Russia. And uh, anybody that's imposed him journalistically and so forth in Russia in the last seven or eight years, they they got assassinated. They weren't quietly put away. They were, they were, they were totally uh, assassinated, shot through the head, put in all the papers to kind of send, send a message. If you want to say something against uh, the KGB or against uh, Putin, this is kind of what happens to you. And that's been going on for some time. We see him, uh, again, uh, taking away the, uh, not only the free press, but some of the other freedoms in, in Russia, bolstering his own position, all along saying that I won't stay in power once my second term is up. Now his second term is coming up, so he's going to take one of his underlings and make him the new president. He'll just have to stay on as prime minister <laughs> so he can continue to call the shots for, oh, another eight years or, uh, or so. Uh, meanwhile, again, uh, selling billions of dollars worth of arms to Iran, which they funnel through to Syria, and now they're in northern Israel, and now put and cut a new deal just in August with Syria, another hotbed of terrorism, and he cuts a deal with them to build two Russian naval bases in the Mediterranean just north of, uh, of Israel, including being equipped with nuclear submarines. Uh, again, Ezekiel said at some point in time in the future, Russia will invade Israel with Iran and then a confederation of other Arab states and they will move against them. That's what Ezekiel said. Of course, these two groups never really got along before until just the last couple of years. And now they, they more than get along. Uh, and, uh, and it seems like the rest of the world is, is trying to stand against them, but uh, some of our other leaders don't exactly get it. So we're moving rapidly towards uh, some of these things that Daniel has talked about that are uh, still yet, yet future. Uh, according to Matthew 24, this will be terrible times for uh, uh, Israel, for the Jewish nation, until the end that is decreed is, is poured out on him, that is the, the Antichrist. Uh, a couple of things just in closing, in terms of what this ought to mean for us. It should give us confidence in the Word of God uh, as we see its, its accuracy and uh, it, it's attacked all, all the time. I don't know if you've got kids in school or you talk to them, or uh, especially if you've got college students, but uh, their faith is absolutely constantly uh, under attack. And there is no 
other viable opinion that uh, is allowed to be uh, offered and so important that we, that we know the facts uh, and the reasons why we should believe uh, God's word. Um, uh, Peter says this in 2 Peter 1, he says, we have the word of the prophets made more certain and we'll do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises uh, in your hearts. Peter had some pretty heavy duty spiritual experiences. He was up there on the Mount of Tribulation. You know, he saw, he got to see Elijah and Moses and hear God the Father speak and, and this whole thing. But he says, compared to that, hey, forget that. We've got the more sure word of uh, of prophecy of, of God's word. Uh, secondly, it should help us see the, the heart of God. Again, as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on that day and being proclaimed as the Messiah, as Daniel said that he would, uh, he says, if you even you had only known this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden for, from your eyes and we see Jesus weeping. Uh, later he weeps over the city. Here he's really just weeping uh, over the people and their, their rejection of him. Uh, when people reject Jesus Christ and the truth of God's word, it, it breaks the heart of God. And third, it should help us realize that the offer of salvation is, is limited. <laughs> this has all been decreed and it's going to happen. And there's, there's going to be an end of this 490-year period. We're in this kind of parenthetical uh, phase right now, the time of the Gentiles, and, and we're waiting for this man, the Antichrist, to cut a deal with Israel to restore and rebuild the temple there on the Temple Mount. From the day he pins that uh, covenant, it'll be a seven-year agreement, and then the clock, that seven-year period, starts clicking again. It's the last seven. The 490 years will end. Uh, there'll be... Uh, radical things that, that happen uh, in terms of God's judgment against the Christ-rejecting world. But uh, the gospel will go out all over the world. In the end, Christ will return. We return with him. We're already with him in heaven because of the rapture of the church. That's already happened, but uh, it'll be a radical time. Salvation is a limited uh, offer. That's, uh, that's the bottom line. But uh, again, I... You know, when I first came to faith in Christ, it was desperation because <laughs> my life was just such a wreck. But I was so glad that once I did and I began to look at Christianity, I, I began to see all the reasons why uh, it's not a leap into the dark. It's a step into the light in terms of uh, the logic and the reason that's, that's behind it. It's completely illogical to deny the existence of God, that he's personal and that he's revealed himself to us through the scriptures and through the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, the evidence of prophecy is uh, incredible. And you can see as we go through this, and I know it's kind of a lot of head knowledge and so forth, but you can see why Daniel is constantly under attack by liberal critics. They hate it. They can't stand it because it is so accurate. It is so specific. It's not generalities as, as we've seen in some of the other world history empires that he predicted, but even to the exact day that Jesus would walk into uh, to Jerusalem. Isn't it just a wonder that more people aren't Christians? But there, there's a blindness there. Paul says the God of this age has blinded people and they don't see the gospel. They don't see the truth of it. And so that's where we need to pray and pray that God would remove that blindness and pray that prayer of Daniel, you know, pray it that it would be for God's kingdom and God's glory and God's reputation and not any selfish reasons within our hearts. And uh, it's, there's such great guidelines there. If we'll follow them, I think we'll see God move uh, tremendously here and, and some of the other places that we go uh, around the world. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word and uh, the accuracy uh, of it. And Lord, we don't want to uh, get so caught up in the, the details of the numbers to uh, miss, Lord, your, your love and, and your concern. But we're thankful that you're a God of, that's got a plan. You're a God of order, Lord, and a God of truth. And you're able to reveal that truth to us in terms of history uh, in advance so that we can trust you and we can trust your word. We can trust the plan that you you have for our lives, Lord. And, and like Daniel's concern, I pray that we'd have that same concern to see that time is short. And, uh, and your word says that if we seek you, we'll find you if we seek you with all of our hearts. Lord, and I pray, uh, Lord, that we'd be seeking you with all of our hearts. As we, uh, Lord, so, so much of our, our country is 
turn their, their back against you, Lord. And we pray that uh, you'd continue to reveal yourself to us by your mercy and, and turn us back, Lord, and do a work uh, in our own lives that we might uh, impact and influence those around us before you return for the church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.